Cool. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. Today, we'll be talking about experiments. It's my pleasure to also welcome everyone watching on the live stream. So I want to start by talking a little bit about what we're going to do in more detail. So we'll start with an uh, overview of experiments. Uh, what are experiments? Why do we want to do them? And how can we think about the difference between the experiments that we've done in the past and the experiments that we can do today and tomorrow? Uh, then we'll talk about how we can move beyond simple A-B tests and use ideas um, from social science to help us design more interesting and more informative experiments. We'll have a break. Uh, then we'll talk about different strategies for actually doing experiments. So a uh, question that I often get is, OK, I want to do an experiment. How do I actually do it? And we'll talk about four different strategies that you can use. None of these strategies is perfect. They all involve different trade-offs. And so a big challenge is finding the right way, the right trade-off for the research question that you have. Um, We'll talk a little bit more then about zero variable cost data and the music lab experiment. And this is a theme that's come up several times um, over the course of the first week. And we'll see this again about thinking about fixed costs and variable costs. But we'll see this particularly in the, in the design of experiments. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about the three R's, which is a sort of ethical way of thinking more about experiments. Because experiments is one of the um, aspects of computational social science that raises some ethical questions. Many people find being in an experiment in and of itself to be um, uh, an issue, let's say. And so we can think more about how we can do ethics specifically in the context of experiments. Uh, and then we'll talk about some logistics, have lunch, and then we get to have a break, uh, which is going to be lovely. Okay. Uh, and then we'll come back on Monday and we'll start the group projects. So <clears throat> I want to start by talking about an experiment that I think does a really good job of illustrating what is the same about experiments and also what is different about experiments now. And this is the paper by uh, Restivo and Vanderite. It's an experimental study of um, peer rewards. So what they were interested in is they were interested in studying the effect of awards on contributions to Wikipedia. So why might they be interested in this? So social scientists in general are interested in why people contribute to things called public goods. These are things where you contribute, but then many other people can benefit, uh, and you can't prevent them from benefiting. And so the question is, why would people contribute to these things that help everyone? So this is a puzzle to social scientists. It's kind of a not that puzzling to non-social scientists. Um, but it's a long-standing question about why people contribute rather than free riding. And so they were interested in this long-standing question in the context of Wikipedia, which is a great example of a public good, uh, where all of the contributions happen to be recorded in great detail. Um, so what did they do? So they picked some deserving editors, um, people who had made a large number of edits. And for the ones of those deserving editors who had not yet received an award, they gave them an award. These awards are called Barn Stars. They're kind of like a pat on the back, like, good job. Um, it has no monetary value, but has a symbolic value in this community. And then they tracked whether people who received these awards were more likely to edit in the future or less likely to edit in the future. So the idea you might expect, people who got these would be more likely to edit. And in fact, what they found is that people who received the Barn Stars actually edited less. Um, and so that seems to be a puzzle. But fortunately, they had also picked a group of people who a control condition who they did not give the Barn Stars to. And those people edited even less. And so what had happened is that for, to end up in the top 1% of editors on Wikipedia, for a given period of time, you have to be editing a lot. And so people, if you tended to edit in bursts, and so you edit a lot, you show up in the top of this list, and then after you've done your burst, you stop editing as much. And so in this case, 
if you only intervened in the world without having a control condition, you would actually make exactly the wrong conclusion, right? So this is the value of the control condition, is it allows you to make sure that you are not fooling yourself. So often people like to go and do stuff in the world, and that is awesome, doing stuff is great, but you also have to remember that if you don't have a control condition, you can potentially draw exactly the wrong conclusion. So that, for those of you who have done experiments, you're very familiar with the importance of having a control condition uh, and why that is valuable. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the mechanics of experiments and how the mechanics in this experiment were in some ways incredibly similar, like you've all heard this story before about the importance of control groups. Um, so I like to think about experiments involve really four main things. So first is you recruit participants. The second is you randomize a treatment. The third is that you deliver the treatment and you deliver the control. So I'm, calling, I'm thinking of the control as kind of a treatment because you can run into problems if the people in the control are getting the treatment some other way. Um, and then fourth is you measure the outcome that you care about. And so in the past, in a sort of Psych 101 style lab experiment, all of this would be done in a sort of in the physical world using analog systems. Um, and what happened in the Restivo and Vanderite was that all of these things were done in digital systems. Recruiting the participants was done completely online. Randomizing the treatment was done completely in a computer. Delivering the treatment was done completely in a digital system. And measuring the outcome was done completely in a digital system. And so, what that means is that this is a fully digital experiment, and what that means is that there's no variable cost. So they, only, they had 200 people participate in their experiment. They could have had 2,000, 20,000, 200,000. They could have had as many people as they want. So this shows you, I guess, some of the power. If you can, the more parts of your experiment that use that are in sort of digitally native infrastructure, the more you get this really nice cost scaling, which means you can run bigger and bigger experiments. Now, this also highlights, I think, an important thing that shows up, will increasingly show up in ethics, that the main constraint on the size of their experiment was not cost, it was ethics. So if they had done 20,000 or 200,000 people, they would have flooded the Wikipedia system and screwed up the ecosystem by sort of devaluing this award. And so increasingly, this is also a great case of thinking about not harm to participants. So no one who got a barn star would be harmed if they gave out a bunch of barn stars. Everybody would be happy if they got one. But there is it in this way, when you're intervening in a real ecosystem, you have the potential to sort of harm that ecosystem if your intervention is extremely large, even if no individual person is harmed. And so in this way, I think this experiment sort of reminds us of one, why we do experiments, why they're helpful, what are the main components of experiments, and then also what we can do now if more and more of those components are done in digital systems. So I wanna um, also clarify a piece of terminology so in English, people often use the word experiment in kind of a loose way. Uh, so for example, I might say, uh, I, I'm gonna experiment with a new pasta sauce recipe tonight. And like, um, that, you, you all know what I mean, I'm trying a new recipe, but that is not an experiment in the way that we are gonna talk about them today. And so I'd like to think about randomized controlled trials. So this has a couple of extra ingredients. Uh, so one is there's randomization, um, and two is there's a control group. So we wanna think of a, there's a very, very important difference between an experiment in the sense that I'm experimenting with the new pasta sauce recipe, and a randomized controlled trial where I have a control group and the people get assigned to the treatments uh, based on some randomization system. So even when I say experiment, which I'm gonna say, uh, I really mean randomized controlled experiment, not just trying a new thing, okay? Now, this difference is a really, really important difference. So 
I, this is one of my favorite quotes illustrating the importance of this. So this is from um, the CEO of Harris Casino. Um, and he's talking about the things that you can do to get fired from Harris. Uh, it's like you don't harass women, you don't steal, and you've got to have a control group. This is one of the things that you can lose your job for at Harris, not running a control group. So again, we see often when people think about the value of experimentation, they think about the value of doing something. Like, I have something I want to do. Like, let's go do that. But often, people are doing stuff all the time. And the real value can come from just creating a control group. So try to think about experiments that way as well. And that will, again, I think, emphasize the importance of a control group in figuring out what we can learn in the world. OK, so this is what I just said. Sometimes we create randomized controlled experiments by creating a treatment group. And sometimes we do it by creating a control group. OK, so social scientists have been doing experiments for a long time. And they often think about, I would say, sort of two main types of experiments. Now, there really are many, many, many kinds of experiments. But I think many people would put them into two big buckets. So there are lab experiments. So these are things that generally happen in a controlled setting, on a, usually in a college uh, um, laboratory. Usually these involve students. Usually these involve a kind of artificial task, a task that people wouldn't normally do. And normally, the stakes of these things are also artificial. Like the, you participate in them for course credit. Then people became, now these are actually really great for allowing you incredibly tight control over what you want to do. So if you have a theory, that theory involves um, being able to manipulate certain things in a very precise way. Lab experiments are great for that. Um, increasingly, uh, people became concerned about what you can actually learn in these very artificial situations. Um, and so they increasingly said, let's do experiments in the field, in the, in the wild. Uh, and the idea there is that the treatments are potentially much more like the treatments uh, are more naturally occurring. They're treatments that exist in the world. The participants in the experiment are potentially more diverse than college students. Uh, the stakes are natural. Uh, often the outcomes that people care about are things they're actually doing in their life. Uh, and so there are many benefits to doing field experiments, and there are many benefits to doing lab experiments. This is kind of a trade-off that social scientists understand. So now I think we're going to increasingly see another dimension where we think more about analog and digital. And so we can imagine there are lab experiments that more or less use digital infrastructure, and there are also field experiments that more or less use digital infrastructure. And so a lot of the trade-offs that we already understand about lab and field experiments, I think, can help us think more about um, the trade-offs involving analog and digital. And so in the um, book, I talk about each of these four examples. Um, so uh, analog lab experiments, this is kind of like Psych 101. This is, we've been learning about the world a long time this way. And we've learned a lot. And I think we can continue to learn a lot this way. Then in these sort of lab style digital experiments, I think this is where I, how I think about a lot of MTurk studies. So uh, a lot of experiments on Mechanical Turk have a lot of similarities to lab experiments. You have this somewhat unusual population. You're giving them something that's so boring that you have to pay them to do it uh, and is disconnected from the rest of their lives. So, it seems new and digital, but it has a lot of the limitations that you would also associate with lab experiments. Then in the sort of, so analog field experiments, again, we have many examples of these from the past. These are great. And then we can sort of move along this dimension based on how much of the experiment uses digital infrastructure. And so I start off by talking about the Recibo and Vanderite, which uses it's fully digital in all of its components. And so that, I think, is an example of a digital field experiment. Okay, And so we'll talk, as we see more examples, this might, I hope, help orient them.
but a lot of, if you are familiar with debates about analog experiment, I mean, between lab experiments and field experiments, a lot of the, the issues that arise are gonna be similar, but are also gonna be a little bit different. For example, zero variable cost data is very hard to get through either of these sort of analog approaches. Any questions about uh, experiments? Why we do experiments, different kinds of experiments? Natalie? Uh, do we have a? Um, this might be more of a question for the room than for you, but sure. I bet you also have ideas. Uh, is there sort of differential appreciation for field experiments across fields? In psychology, they're the gold standard, but people don't take the time to do them that often. Yep. So I don't know if that's really, really different for other people or in your experience. Yeah. I think this is a great question. And uh, one of the things is for today, I've, the slides are much shorter. And so we will have more time for question and discussion. So I would encourage you all to think about questions. So one is like differences. So the, I would sort of, one way of asking the question is, are there differences in how different fields respond to lab and field experiments? And I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, I think part of this is tradition in the fields, and part of it is the kinds of processes that they're trying to study. So my sense is that some of the stuff psychologists are interested in is very subtle. It involves like teasing out very subtle differences in what's happening inside of people's heads, which makes sense because they're psychologists. That's what they should be trying to figure out. Um, and so in those settings, it's very hard to get at these subtle processes using field experiments. Other people uh, in other fields, like in sociology and political science, I think are less interested in the very subtle things happening inside of people's heads and are more interested in potentially the impacts of certain things on the world, in which case I think field experiments are preferable. Um, and so I think there's some intellectual reasons for this, and then there's also some sort of just historical reasons. I think also another difference is that once you have the infrastructure for doing one of these kinds of experiments, it you want to keep doing those rather than switching to the other. So if you have a lab and you're all set up to run people through the lab, then it starts to seem really attractive to do lab experiments uh, and ask questions that can be answered with lab experiments. And if you have a lot of experience partnering with organizations and getting them excited about running field experiments, then I think setting up a lab experiment seems not as attractive. Other questions? All right, let's keep going. Oh, yeah, Carson. <laughs> oh, about the Wikipedia study. Uh, yes. They did talk to the Wikipedia team, or were they just setting up the study without asking for permission? Because so, I feel like many of these experiments you could argue that you do them in a way without harming the environment so mm -hmm. much but so actually without getting permission but i still feel like that's an important thing right it's a great question so this i guess gets to the nature of consent and how consent would work and whether you need consent from that community uh so i don't know the details of this paper i know this was reviewed by their irb and it was done in before 2012, so it might have been done around 2010, let's say. Uh, I, right now, Wikipedia has a process where if you want to do research on Wikipedia, you go through a Wikipedia review. Uh, I don't know if that process existed at that time. It's one of the few settings where there is a com meaningful way for to get community consent. Yeah? Anyone? It's actually a very small question, just follow up to what you just sure. said about uh, Wikipedia consent. Does it apply to any work, or only to the work where you actually modify something there? So I believe, I, I'm not an expert on the Wikipedia research review process. My understanding is that it is anything that involves contacting Wikipedia community members, 
So not just experiments. So for example, I believe it's the case, I would not recommend this, but I believe it's the case you could write a bot that would send messages to a bunch of Wikipedia editors. So if you had a survey, you might say, okay, I want to scrape Wikipedia and I want to send my survey to 10,000 editors. And so even though there's no experiment, that you can see why Wikipedia might not want researchers doing that. And so I believe any contact with the community, uh, but I do not believe they expect, uh, I don't know how they treat if you're going to do analysis of the log data. Because the log data are fully public, and I believe, I would speculate, but I don't know, that they would think log data is public, everyone understands that about Wikipedia, people don't have an expectation of privacy for the log data, and so you might be able to analyze log data without going through this process. But again, I would refer you to the Wikipedia page for that. But what is into Okay. So they allow again what? Sorry, I didn't. Mm -hmm. But will this apply, for example, you do small edits on the pages? Uh, because you kind of, you can't talk, but implicitly kind of, because they. Yes, yes. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, like, what if you, if you, you, for example, you experiment in like making certain edits, like. Okay. So, um, so one way of thinking about this, taking a step back from this, is a lot of the ethical principles and frameworks we talked about before would apply to any study that you want to do on Wikipedia. But then there's this additional. Um, process that they have created for themselves as their community, and we should try to respect that privacy and, uh, policy in the sense of we have this sort of um, respect for law and public interest, sort of like follow the rules of the communities you're doing research about. Other questions? <laughs>